All right. Again, thank you for coming. Tonight, uh, we have uh, part two with Dr. John Pafford. Um, I think most of you know John. He's, he's one of our more popular speakers here at the church. Uh, he, uh, I, I'm sorry, he's our most popular speaker here. Uh, and, uh, so anyway, yeah. I'll stay, I'll stay. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, uh, and uh, it, is, uh, it has been a joy for me to know him. He originally spoke, at, uh, I met him, even though um, uh, we had a connection at Northwood. Um, he had, I really, the first time I ever met him was when he was referred to me from the Mackinac Center, uh, where he has uh, done quite a bit of work. Um, most of you know that the Mackinac Center is probably one of the most influential think tanks. It's kind of the Heritage Foundation of Michigan on the, on the state level. Uh, and he, is a, uh, he has done a lot of work with Larry Reed there. And, uh, and he came uh, and spoke as a representative of the Mackinac Center for our Harmony of Interest, uh, Harmony of Interest Conference several years ago. And uh, everyone enjoyed him so much there. That, uh, that, that uh, they asked if we would have him back, and since then, we, he has not been able to get rid of me. Uh, even though he has caller ID, I switch telephones all the time, <laughs> so he picks up the phone. But uh, anyway, uh, tonight he's going to be coming and building on his presentation from last week, uh, and um, it's been our joy to work with Dr. Pafford. We, we, helped, uh, we helped him with the publication of a book that uh, he has here called On, Solid, On the Solid Rock, Christian Public Policy, that... We did jointly with our church, uh, the Center for uh, Cultural Leadership with Andrew Sandlin, and, uh, and he just recently had a new book published, uh, which is, uh, I just started reading it last, uh, last week after I picked up my copy. It's an excellent book. Um, he's written several others as well, but uh, Dr. Pafford, it is great to have you with us. Just come and share uh, your presentation on God's providential founding of our country. Thank you. Thank you very much. Every time I start up here, I'm all set to roast Cray. Then he says nice things about me, and uh, I'm consumed with guilt. <laughs> so, so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Good to see a good many of you back. Tonight, what I want to focus on is the founding generation, the founding fathers. Spoke last week in terms of the colonial origins of our country. Now the founding generation, referred to by the historian Joseph Ellis, as the greatest generation of political leaders in American history, and I think you can make a very good case that they would be the greatest generation of political leaders in the history of Western civilization. Yes, very, very providential, and again, an outstanding group of men. I will talk about some of them individually. They were either Christians in general, or they were people who at least were influenced and expressed a Christian worldview. Uh, you really don't find among the founding generation, for example, those who were responsible for the United States Constitution, individuals who would reject a Christian worldview. So again, they're either Christians or they project that Christian worldview. There had been the tremendous influence of the Enlightenment movement in the earlier part of the 18th century prior to the American Independence Movement. This was something which focused on human reason as the highest authority. <coughs> there was in the Continental Enlightenment movement a real hostility to religion in general, Christianity in particular. Uh, in the Scottish Enlightenment, which did influence some of the founders, there was still the reason orientation, but not the hostility to religion. But the Enlightenment was a powerful movement and the appeal to reason is something which strikes responsive cores within fallen human beings. Because we humans do uh, like the idea that what is right and what is good and what is true is what we see to be right and good and true. Uh, we like that idea of straining things through our reason and what passes the test of our reason is therefore accepted. And for these people of the Enlightenment, there was very definitely a straining of biblical teachings through the sieve of their intellects. And again, what survived would be accepted. So there had been a watering down of, as a result of the impact of the Enlightenment, but there also had been a strengthening of Christianity as a result of the first great awakening. 
that's something on which anyone could spend a great deal of time, particularly anyone who is a Christian, as well as being interested in American history. That first great awakening kicked off in particular by Jonathan Edwards, also involving people such as Gilbert Tennant, uh, George Whitfield, a uh, good many <coughs> leaders of different denominations were responsible for this revival of Christian doctrine, Christian teaching. There was an impact that there was a somewhat of, an, of a lessening of the influence of the organized church, but you don't want to make too much of that. That is something <coughs> as sort of a secondary impact of the Enlightenment, but don't carry it too far. By and large, the first great, sorry, the awakening, I don't mean enlightenment. Every now and then I do play back what I've said, and it'll suddenly hit me. Whoops, where did that come from? Uh, we can't erase the tape, but I'll just continue on. As a, in general, the impact of the first great awakening was tremendous. For anyone who's a Christian, you're going to thank the Lord for the impact of those individuals. Shortly before the United States Constitution was written, it still is instructive to look into state constitutions. Now again, this is after the independence have been declared, before the Constitution. You will still find state constitutions which are going to reflect the colonial charters and will have very strong Christian pronouncements in them. For example, the 1776 Delaware Constitution had a requirement in it, in Article 22 of the Delaware Constitution, Every elected and appointed official in the state of Delaware had to take the following oath, I, then the name, do profess faith in God the Father, and in Jesus Christ his only Son, and in the Holy Ghost, one God, blessed forevermore. And I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. So, very obviously in Delaware, the impact of the Enlightenment has certainly not become dominant. Not by any means. This is uh, after uh, several decades of Enlightenment teaching having infiltrated into higher education in particular. Then in Maryland, in Article uh, 35, also 1776, no test, no other test or qualification ought to be required than such oath of support and fidelity to this state and a declaration of a faith, sorry, a declaration of a belief in the Christian religion. And even in Massachusetts, not renowned for being the greatest center of biblical Christianity in the country today, uh, in chapter 6, article 1, everyone elected to a state office or to the legislature must stipulate as follows, I, then your name, do declare that I believe the Christian religion and have firm persuasion of its truth. Now, in terms of the 55 men who were responsible for writing the United States Constitution, there are differences of opinion as to how Christian do we make them. Again, they're either Christian or they do reflect a Christian worldview. But how deep was the personal faith within those individuals? We are very clear in terms of historical records about many of them. Uh, people such as uh, Roger Sherman of Connecticut. These were people be people we would call Bible-believing evangelicals today. At any period of time, they would be so classified. Uh, there are others where there would be substantial doubt. But uh, it still is interesting to read what different historians have had to say about the 55 men responsible for the Constitution. Russell Kirk, a uh, political hero of mine, has uh, argued that at least 50 of them would have subscribed to the Apostles' Creed. Now, we can't know for sure about some of these people as to exactly what they believe, because this was a time when, for most gentlemen, uh, you didn't really get demonstrative about things such as religion or your feelings in general. So we don't know positively if Kirk is right. Uh, being a fan of Russell Kirk, I would like to conclude that he was right, just as an emotional reaction, and he very well could have been. Certainly, uh, these were men who belonged to churches which subscribed to the Apostles' Creed. Uh, John Eidsmo, a contemporary <coughs> Christian scholar, 
has maintained that the majority of the delegates to the Constitutional Convention had expressed their adherence to Christian doctrine. And in terms of expressing their adherence, uh, I think he's right. There are going to be some others who are going to question what Eidsmo said. They're going to be less optimistic about the Christianity of these people. But I think it's clear that they certainly were members in good standing of churches which did require this profession. All of the churches to which they belonged, such as the Episcopal Church at that time, would not require people to make a statement of testimony to having been born again, to having come to personal faith in Christ as Savior and Lord. But they at least would have to subscribe to prayers uh, to Christ as Savior, again, to the Articles of Religion and to the Apostles' Creed. So, yes, I think you can conclude that there's a good case to be made for the Christianity of these men. Yet, what is intriguing is that if these men were Christian, why is there nothing about faith in the Constitution? Why does not the Constitution of the United States reflect anything akin to the Constitution of the state of Delaware? Why is there nothing in the United States Constitution that would reflect the articles that were stated in the colonial charters? Uh, that's an interesting question. And different people have different answers which they will present as to why nothing will be found there. Personally, I think that there was a certain watering down which had taken place by that time in terms of what people were prepared to want to put into a governing doctrine, a, a governing document. I think there had been some watering down there. Now again, these are not a bunch of secular progressives, SPs to use Bill O'Reilly's phrase. No, they're not a bunch of secular progressives at all. Uh, these are a bunch of people, by and large, whom we would classify today as conservatives, and by and large, whom we would classify as Christians. But you also understand today that there are Christians who will not be explicit about their faith in terms of public policy. They won't go into the public arena and bring their faith with them. Instead, you've got people who will argue that now that I'm in the public arena, I must keep my faith out of this because I can't impose my faith on others. Well, of course you cannot impose your faith on, faith on others, but if you are a Christian, your faith goes with you everywhere you go. Now, there's an interesting argument that was made by Pat Robertson in defense of these people. Pat Robertson wrote, That Constitution, as our man-made plan for government, is not an appropriate or necessary place to speak of God. The Declaration had said enough. Well, first of all, back to the Declaration, to jog your memories, if they need any jogging. The Declaration of Independence does clearly present a faith in God, but it's certainly not what you'd call a Christian document. God is presented in broad terms and rather deistic terms, uh, not in explicitly Christian terms. For example, there's a reference to the laws of nature and of nature's God. There's a reference to the Creator, endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's nothing wrong with that statement that we're endowed by our Creator, but again, that's not explicitly Christian. There are a lot of people who are not close to Christianity who could agree with those words. So the Declaration, again, is clear on a belief in God, but it's not, a, it's not at all the Christianity that you find once more in the colonial charters or in early state constitutions. And when Pat Robertson made the statement that this was not an appropriate or necessary place to speak of God, it's interesting to me that those who were responsible for establishing governments in the English colonies certainly considered their constitutional documents to be the appropriate, necessary place to say these things. And when you come to a time when you don't think it's desirable uh, or even advisable to put these statements in a founding political document, <coughs> I start to scratch my head a bit about the trend which is observable. Uh, Clarence Carson, another uh, fundamentally sound historian, <coughs> set forth the same conclusion 
saying the decision of the Founding Fathers to leave out of the Constitution any Christian foundation statement did not mean in most cases they were not believers. Uh, they believed that Christian precepts undergirded the government they established, but that the enunciation of these precepts should not be made by the government. Now, it could very well be true that these were men who were believers, but they still did not believe that they should be stating that faith in this document. Uh, Carson could be right, but that still disappoints me about them. I think that was a mistake to have made. Uh, Russus Rush Dooney once uh, made the comment, when reference is made to the Christian nature of the United States, the objection immediately raised is the absence of reference to Christianity in the Constitution. The Constitution would never have been ratified had such <coughs> reference been made. And uh, Rush Dooney went on to explain that he believed that an opposition to the idea of a state church is what was behind keeping all reference to Christianity out of the Constitution. Now, whether or not the Constitution could have been passed and ratified, whether it would have been approved by those present, and whether it would have been ratified by the states with a Christian statement in there, I don't know. I don't know. I think it would have been, but I can't prove that. Uh, I would like to think it would have been, and that could be dominating my opinion. Uh, I would like to think this is true, therefore I will state that's in my opinion. But to be honest, I can't prove it, and of course Rush Dooney can't prove the contrary either. We just don't know, unless we had some way of arranging time machines, and popping back in time, and doing things a different way, and observing what's going to happen. I'm sure all of us would like to pop back in time and undo a few of the things that we have done, or go back and uh, buy some property in the ocean 25 or 30 years ago, go take your money from today, go back in time, buy some property, and then go back to the present with your deed in hand. But we don't have that opportunity. Uh, so again, a uh, very intriguing point by Rush Dooney. Uh, I don't think that he, such a fear was a justification for not trying. Uh, Mark Knoll, another contemporary Christian scholar, believes that, yes, some of these men, such as Roger Sherman, were solidly <coughs> Christian, but he doesn't really think most of them were. Now, that's again sort of the flip side of people such as Kirk and Eidsmo, who said most of them were. Now, Eidsmo, again, another Christian scholar. We're not dealing here with somebody who has an axe to grind by de-Christianizing the founders. Uh, certainly, Noll doesn't have that in mind at all. He thinks most of them were not. He made the statement, most of the leaders, most of the leading founders, sorry, most of the leading founders were sincerely religious persons. At the same time, the most influential of their number practiced decidedly non-traditional forms of Christianity. And Harold O.J. Brown, another man still living, uh, still practicing. He's another one of these people, a bit older than I am, who still has all his marbles and is still functioning well. And it's always encouraging to have people older than I still making it. <laughs> uh, but Harold O.J. Brown said of our early national leaders, they were more deistic than Christian. Again, deism, uh, briefly on that. Uh, probably most of you are familiar with it. But deism is the concept that God exists God is the creator, but God does not intervene in the affairs of this world. It's not a Christian belief. They certainly are not going to be biblically grounded. They certainly are not Trinitarian at all. Uh, people like Benjamin Franklin have been classified as deistic. Uh, Franklin had that famous prayer he made, at the uh, called for, at the Constitutional Convention. Uh, but it's not clear... Uh, just how much Benjamin Franklin believed. He believed in God, he believed in an afterlife, but he regarded the deity of Christ as irrelevant. It doesn't matter whether Christ was God or not. It's not, it doesn't matter. And shortly before his death, he made the rather flip statement when somebody was witnessing to him about Christ that, well, I'll find out soon enough. I'll find out soon enough. Uh, that's a terrifying thought. Yeah, if you're close to dying and haven't made a commitment, you will find out soon enough. Uh, but that knowledge is not going to be anything pleasant at all. So there were a number of non-traditionalist people, certainly uh, Thomas Jefferson, 
was a non-traditionalist believer. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, I will quote later, uh, certainly uh, you would not classify him as a Christian. Uh, John Adams, whom I do admire by and large, John Adams prayed every day, read the Bible every day, but he was Unitarian. He did not believe in the deity of Christ at all. Uh, but again, a very admirable man, and you can read many of his statements where he's talking about the power of prayer, the afterlife, and biblical teachings, and you're going to say, hallelujah, but push a little further, and definitely Unitarian. Again, uh, no deity of Christ at all. Uh, Harold O.J. Brown, I said of the earlier of the leaders, they were more deistic than Christian. In light of the fact that people of non-Christian background, that is Jews, were a minuscule minority in the original colonies and the new states, we have to recognize in the Founding Fathers' scrupulous avoidance of reference to Christ more than a mere expression of tact towards non-Christians. Between the early colonial charters and compacts that explicitly mention the Christian faith and speak of Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of the world, and the Declaration of Independence, there is a marked difference. Uh, he's right. He's right. Now again, I'm, I'm not a debunker of the Founding Fathers. I very much admire that generation. And I would argue that this is the most outstanding single generation of political leaders whom you can find in the history of Western civilization. Men of integrity, courage, <coughs> intelligence, and again, either Christian faith or a Christian world view. A very impressive group of people. But I don't think we do the cause of truth any good if we gloss over some things and try to, for example, Christianize Thomas Jefferson. Uh, that is not pleasing and honoring to God if we ignore what is very evident. Uh, James Madison, for example, believed that a high providence directed the course of human events, but he rejected the divine inspiration of the Bible. Uh, so you certainly have a problem there. He was a churchgoer, though. He was a churchgoer, and so was Thomas Jefferson, a churchgoer. I'll read a statement by Jefferson later. He, not too many, uh, just about four years before his death, wrote a letter to a friend in which he is really looking forward to the time when the United States would be Unitarian. That's what he saw as the future of this country, Unitarian faith, and that human reason is the only really sound source of knowledge which we have. Thomas Jefferson, uh, as you probably know, produced what is called by uh, sort of a nickname, the Jefferson Bible, took the New Testament, took the Gospels, took the Gospels, and removed any reference to the deity of Christ and any reference to the miracles of Christ and kept the moral teachings of Christ. That's what Jefferson wanted. He wanted the moral teachings of Christ to prevail in society, to control society. Now, that's great. I don't think anyone here is going to argue that we don't want the moral teachings of Christ to prevail. But, 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 rather obviously, we don't eliminate all the references to deity. After all, then, who is this person whose moral teachings we're going to follow? Uh, it's somebody who uh, either was a nut claiming these things about himself, or we have an unreliable book in which other people later have added all these things about him to make him seem more important, which would seem to make the total book rather unreliable as a source of ethical teachings. But, once more, uh, there is still, though, a clear example that these people have given to us about uh, integrity, courage, intelligence. There's no question about that. There are a lot of more um, uh, very admirable aspects to James Madison, particularly the earlier James Madison, uh, who was uh, involved in uh, getting the Constitution ratified, writing the Federalist Papers along with Hamilton and Jay. That's a very admirable man, a very wise man. A man who did understand, as certainly did Matt, uh, Hamilton and Jay, who were Christian, uh, <coughs> Madison, along with them, understood the sin nature. He understood that human beings are not perfect. 
He did not have that liberal view that the best way to have a perfect society is to remove control over people. Just leave people alone and all the goodness will percolate to the surface. Uh, it's been said by some that, well, yeah, of course, the cream does come to the surface. Yeah, so does the scum. But uh, anyway, that's... Uh, but did, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, sorry, George Washington, I think probably was a Christian. He's not as easy a source of information on his faith as John Jay, but I conclude really that George Washington probably was a Christian, not a deeply thinking one, not certainly one who spent a lot of time uh, in theological discussion, but I think he was a believing man. Uh, there are people on both sides of that. Peter Marshall, the young Peter Marshall, who's still alive, son of the uh, old Senate chaplain. Uh, there are a few people in here who might be old enough to remember a movie, the, A Man Called Peter, uh, and a book, Man Called Peter, written by Catherine Marshall, Peter Marshall's widow, and then made into a movie with uh, Richard Todd, starring as Peter Marshall. Uh, Peter Marshall uh, does believe that George Washington was a solid Christian. Uh, John Eidsmall believes that he was a Christian. Uh, Gary North, by the way, who's not known as being a gentle analyst of people. Uh, Gary North had a rather, oh, almost sort of a left-handed compliment he gave Washington, saying that he was probably a closet Trinitarian. That's an interesting compliment. A closet Trinitarian. Well, I'd rather be called a closet Trinitarian than a closet, well, never mind. <laughs> But that was, those were the words of Gary North. Um, then, uh, but others are less complimentary. Uh, Douglas Southall Freeman, who wrote a massive seven-volume biography of Washington, great study, uh, but uh, he doesn't have much at all to say about Washington's religious beliefs. And that uh, he had, for him, uh, religion was not particularly important, not too important. And then you have the worst of them all, in my opinion, Francis Rufus Bellamy did a biography of Washington, believed that Washington uh, did not have any conviction of personal faith, and that he was a deist. So again, though, there can be this debate, uh, because it's not totally clear uh, from Washington's journals exactly where he stood. There are the accounts of the handwritten prayers that have been found in papers, there are those who have analyzed the handwriting, say it wasn't Washington's. Of uh, those who think it was Washington's, they're not. They're trying to figure out: Did he compose these prayers or copy them down? Uh, but again, I would conclude that he probably uh, was a Christian. Alexander Hamilton is a very interesting study. He followed a course which is not that unusual among many of us who are human beings. Alexander Hamilton came from a uh, not a de quite a deprived economic background, but a lower level economic background. He was an illegitimate child. The family did not have, uh, his mother raised him, didn't have too much in the way of funds. He did attract people by his brilliance. He was born in the British West Indies. Did attract people by his brilliance. Came to the United States. Uh, entered into what was then called King's College in New York City, now Columbia University. And those who knew him there referred to his Christianity. Uh, he was raised a Christian. He showed faith in his background. He came to the United States. He associated with solid Christian people. And the Christianity seems to be very genuine, very real. Uh, he didn't get to have too much education because along came the Revolutionary War. He went right in and established an excellent <laughs> combat record as an artillery officer. Then was on Washington's staff, a brilliant member of the staff. He didn't like staff work, no one wanted a combat assignment. And finally did want, get one out of Washington in time to show real heroism in the last major battle at Yorktown. Uh, so Hamilton did have that opportunity. He did show real heroism. <coughs> then Hamilton is really the second most powerful figure in the Washington administration, <coughs> second only to Washington. There is no one on Washington's level, absolutely no one on Washington's level. Uh, it's absolutely astounding to do a study of him. Uh, you can't study him and not be well aware of the greatness 
uh, real greatness of it. If there's any tragedy today, it's that it's not that we are rejecting Washington today, it's that for so many Americans today, they're just sort of, oh yeah, great president, but not a reflective concept of his greatness, not a reflective understanding of him. Just sort of, well, yeah, we've always heard he's great, we've heard he's great, uh, got pictures of him everywhere, monuments, memorials. Uh, and I think he's fascinating to study, though. Fascinating man to study. Uh, large in stature for that time. We're not sure, anywhere from 6'2 to 6'4, uh, which was large in stature then, and even today it's above average. And a very robust individual, very physically strong and great physical endurance. Uh, an outdoor man, uh, regarded by many as the best horseman of that era. And, and again, very tremendously robust, uh, magnificent constitution, which held up so well during all the years of combat. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, though, was second only to George Washington in significance and importance. Uh, Alexander Hamilton, then, having moved into the government, he's Secretary of the Treasury, he is sort of, in effect, a Prime Minister. Uh, he is a key figure in government under Washington. During these years of, of Hamilton's greatness, during the years of greatest success in Hamilton's life, you don't find much Christianity. Uh, that can happen to people who get off to a good start in life and everything is going beautifully. Things can't be better. Uh, you're popular with uh, many people. Uh, Hamilton had those who couldn't stand him, but that didn't bother him. He was a man of ideas, a man of courage, a man of principle, and a man of great power. And again, you just don't find Christianity being expressed by Hamilton then. And you do find some problems in Hamilton's life, such as uh, extramarital affairs. That came in. Then after Hamilton fell from power, you have a return to his Christian roots. That's interesting. Some people cannot be both Christian and tremendously successful. Of course, plenty of other people can. Our country's history is filled with people who have been excellent Christians and powerful figures. But some individuals find that the more successful they are, the more they tend to drift away. And I don't need things anymore. You know the old saying, there are no atheists in a foxhole. By implication, there are plenty of atheists you find out of foxholes when things are going well. There are people who get back to God when things have gone askew. And Hamilton did. He started a Christian, the Christian Constitutional Society, and in particular, during the day and a half that Alexander Hamilton lay mortally wounded uh, from the bullet of Aaron Burr, during about 36 hours that uh, Alexander Hamilton lay mortally wounded, he gave tremendous Christian testimonies. Uh, he referred to his faith in Christ as Savior and Lord. His sins are forgiven, washed clean by the blood of the Lamb, eternal life through faith in Christ as Savior. Wonderful statements. You could not want for a better statement of Christian faith. Uh, so Hamilton did die in that state. Uh, John Jay is another figure who is extremely intriguing to me. I would say that of the people who never served as President of the United States, John Jay probably had, of the founding generation people, the most impressive record. Having served as a member of the Continental Congress, then as President of the Continental Congress, as our ambassador, Minister Plenipotentiary, our ambassador to Spain, a member of the Peace Commission uh, that met in Paris that arranged for uh, the independence of the United States and peace with Britain, remember that commission. He then served as what was then called Secretary of Foreign Affairs, Secretary of State today. Uh, then he was the first Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court and a two-term governor of the state of New York. A man who was a Christian from an early stage who did not go through the development area or the downward development area of Alexander Hamilton. You have Jay's Christianity coming and staying. You don't find any breath of scandal, professional or personal, in John Jay's life. Uh, which may be one of the reasons why there haven't been that many biographies written of him. Uh, he wasn't a military hero and there's none of this uh, colorful stuff about all these nice juicy things 
uh, we can read about. Uh, but a very impressive man, very impressive man, and a devout Christian. When his wife died in 1802, shortly after he had retired from public life, he took his adult children into the adjoining room and read them 1 Corinthians chapter 15 about eternal life through Christ. Went over that with him. Of course, he was suffering the great loss, but, and he never remarried. Uh, he did function well, effectively, uh, but uh, there's something that was missing from his life from then on. But, but, but. Above everything else, though, was John Jay's clear conviction that he and Sarah would be united and uh, they would be together through eternity. So he is a very <coughs> impressive individual in terms of his accomplishments politically and in terms of his Christian faith. Uh, so there are people such as he, such as uh, John Jay, such as Alexander Hamilton, uh, who do give us great joy, and we read of them, and thank the Lord for this. But again, I keep coming back to the same point. Uh, I guess I would say I'm giving two and a half cheers to the founding generation overall. Uh, I would like to, if they're all Christians, I would give three cheers, but let's be honest, uh, you're going to be kind of hard put to give a full three cheers if you're going to look for that criterion that everyone is a good solidly professing Christian. But again, a very, very impressive group of men who deserve our respect immensely. And we, they deserve our gratitude. And we should certainly thank God for what these people accomplished in setting up this country. I do have, now, what I wanted, by the way, next week I want to get into some things that have gone wrong since the founding generation and then talk in terms of what to do about it. Because after all, and I think I mentioned last week, there is to a certain extent the validity of looking at what has gone badly, because otherwise, why change anything? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Uh, but certainly, it is wrong, wrong, wrong for us, especially for us as Christians, to simply grumble without having anything constructive and positive to present. Uh, you all know, I'm sure, people who are awfully good at grumbling and complaining and pointing out things that are wrong. Try to get out of them. Okay, very interesting. What do we do? Well, that's not their calling. Uh, it's not my calling to point out what's, uh, what should be done, but only what's wrong. There are, all pe there are people like that. God is only, religion is only mentioned in two places in the Constitution. Only in two places does religion get mentioned. Uh, in Article 6 of the Constitution is the statement that no one holding office under the Constitution shall be subjected to any religious test. There will be no religious test for holding office under the Constitution. This is not like Massachusetts or Delaware where you have to have a profession. The people who wrote the Constitution did understand that the states had this, now, the best spin you can put on this is that it was their conviction that the United States government would be a very limited power and that the states had covered this with professions of faith being required for holding office at that level. And that very well could be. It very well could be. Uh, however, there's also the possibility that we were starting down the watering down path because states are going to start drifting away from these requirements. At the time the Constitution was written, most of the states did have state churches, but they were going to gradually fade out. James Madison would be instrumental in getting rid of Anglicanism as the state church in Virginia. And finally, as you move into the 19th century, you're going to have Massachusetts as the last state to have a state church. That's in the 1830s when they got rid of it. So it could be that the fact that the Constitution uh, had that stipulation, no, no, uh, uh, no oath is going to be required, no test of faith, no affirmation, the fact that they said that could be the beginnings of this watering down. But again, I repeat, just to be fair, 
There are those who maintain that the conviction was that we don't have to say that in the United States Constitution. The United States <coughs> government is going to be a power less significant than the states, and the states have it covered. So there we are. I'm not sure which is right. I can't prove it. I tend to think the uh, watering down is the right one. But I think it's also clear, though, that these men who wrote the United States Constitution certainly do not have in mind a time when there would actually be an antipathy between the government and Christianity. Uh, even Thomas Jefferson, who talked in terms of the separation of church and state, though did live at a time and didn't object to when uh, church services were being held on federal government property. Uh, he recommended to people that they study the ethical teachings of Christ, that they learn, the Bible, they, they go to the Bible to learn how to live their lives. Jefferson was clear on that. So Jefferson at least was not, again, back to Bill O'Reilly, a secular progressive. He certainly did not have that in mind whatsoever. So undoubtedly, I would like to think, and I believe I'm right in so thinking, that uh, if not all of those men, at least the overwhelming majority of them, would be upset about things such as the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals <coughs> ruling that the words under God must be taken out of the pledge to the flag. They probably would not have liked, uh, say, the uh, uh, a court case that came out of uh, Pennsylvania in 1963 that Bible reading in the public schools is unconstitutional. So we have, though, in Article 6 then, that there is no oath which can be required of anybody for holding office under the United States Constitution. And we also have the words in the First Amendment, which did cover several different items, but in the First Amendment are the words that uh, there will be no, no religion, I'm sorry, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Congress shall make no law regarding an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. All the rulings that we have had by the federal court system since then pertaining to religion have stemmed from those words in the First Amendment. In the early United States, there was no conception whatsoever that this meant that there would be no tie between religion and government. Uh, the first Congress under the Constitution, with that First Amendment in there, did appropriate money for Bibles for the Indians in the Northwest Territory, the upper Midwest today. That was done. Uh, the states continued to have state churches if they wanted them. There was nothing in the First Amendment which was interpreted to mean that a state does not have the full jurisdiction over religion within its borders. It simply uh, cannot have a state church, but it certainly, uh, sorry, it cannot, there cannot be a national state church, but there certainly can be a state church within the borders of a state, no question whatsoever. Congress should make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Later in the 19th century, there would be a bill uh, introduced, a proposed constitutional amendment introduced by then U.S. Representative James G. Blaine prohibiting states from having state churches. Now, interesting, if the First Amendment has covered this, why would we have to have this amendment? Also, it's intriguing to note that the Blaine proposed amendment, which obviously didn't make it, uh, the Br Blaine proposed amendment had come after the end of the Civil War, after the 14th Amendment had already come into existence. The courts today, which want to get rid of religion, and have done a pretty good job doing it. There are some cases where we Christians have won Supreme Court cases. There are other areas where we've lost. But the federal court jurisdiction over what is done by states and by local governments will stem from words in the 14th Amendment that every citizen is guaranteed equal protection of the laws. Sounds fine. Everyone is guaranteed equal protection of the laws. 
there has developed now an interpretation, a judicial interpretation, that that 14th Amendment guarantee of equal protection of the laws means that therefore the wording in the First Amendment must now apply to state and local law as well. If we are going to guarantee to everyone equal protection of the laws, that must mean that it's not just that Congress can make a law respecting the establishment of religion, uh, neither can Pennsylvania or Mobile, Alabama. No state, no local government can do it. This has been contested by judicial scholars, this doctrine of merging or, interpret, uh, or incorporating. Merging or incorporating, again, the idea that the First Amendment, because of the 14th Amendment wording, has been incorporated into all law throughout the country. That's been objected to by a number of judicial scholars, but it is a prevailing judicial doctrine. It is the prevailing judicial doctrine today. And so that's why we have what seems to be a clearly limited statement of the First Amendment, Congress shall, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's why we have the federal court system applying that to all levels of government. But there have been federal judges, uh, such as Brevard Hand in Alabama, who disagreed with this whole doctrine and threw out a court case, but he got overturned by the appeals court, naturally, because again, the prevailing judicial orthodoxy in this country is that the First Amendment must apply to everything. We're going to continue in this country, as I'll get into towards the end next week, of having cases in session after session after session of the Supreme Court that will deal with religion because we no longer have a consensus in this country as to what we mean by an establishment of religion. That used to be taken clearly to mean no national state church. I think that's the way it was understood by the framers of the Constitution, and that's the way the words establishment of religion normally are regarded by people. You keep hearing of the Church of England as the established church. Uh, so I think it's clear that the framers had in mind nothing more than that, but that consensus doesn't exist in this country any longer. And we do have a wider gap in this country between those who are firm believers. Uh, we have very powerful Christianity in this country today, including more and more voices in the public arena who are solidly Christian, but we have the opposite as well. And more and more Americans are being forced out of that comfortable middle ground. I was raised in a country in which it was rather easy uh, to come be brought up because, as I may have expressed, uh, there were societal expectations and societal pressures on behavior. If we kids in my hometown misbehaved and created a ruckus and were yelling and disturbing people somewhere, our parents would be called. If I got in trouble at school, which had been known to happen, I was in bigger trouble when I got home. And uh, I had mentioned, I, maybe, uh, trouble is I'm teaching a course at Saginaw Valley, by the way, covering much of the same material in four sessions. And I would hate to think that I'm repeating myself. I want to uh, give an excuse in case I had been doing that, so you wouldn't all decide that I've slipped into my dotage. <laughs> um, I still remember my wife's name. Um, uh, Martha, Martha, that's it. Uh, but, again, uh, there, were, uh, there was societal pressure. There was societal pressure. Uh, morality uh, was more of a powerful societal force because, to put it bluntly, if you ever got a girl pregnant, you're expected to marry her. That was the expectation. Uh, today, that expectation doesn't exist. Uh, in much of the country, illegitimacy is ignored or openly accepted, and so there isn't that stigma. So, uh, we don't have the same consensus. For a young person growing up today, there is a greater need to really come to grips with what he or she believes. You are not going to get, if I'm talking to anyone, I guess some of you can be classified as younger people, uh, I won't try to define or that. <laughs> yeah, all right. Good point. Um, you're not going to get the societal help 
You're going to have to come to grips with what do you really believe? What are your convictions? There was more societal help in the past. You would be hurt professionally in most professions if you had a bad moral reputation. That would hurt you. Uh, obviously not even back then in the entertainment field as much, but somewhat even then. Uh, Ingrid Bergman lost some movie contracts when she got involved in an extramarital affair. Uh, so again, there was more societal help then. We don't have the same consensus that we once did, and so we're having to sort things out on a case-by-case-by-case -case -case basis. What do those words mean, an establishment of religion? And what do the words free exercise mean? And what happens when uh, my free exercise of religion clashes with what you say is an establishment of religion? The courts have to sort these things out. Uh, we don't have that consensus anymore. We don't have a clearly explicit statement in the Constitution. So we're going to fight it out. And again, there are many Christian law organizations which are doing a great job. So there is much to be encouraged about today. But I'm going to stop on the founding generation and the First Amendment, which I think they clearly understood to be simply precluding having a national state church. I think that's clearly what they had in mind. Again, a fantastic generation. Uh, so I'll stop there and uh, get into any questions, because I see your hand up no, there. John, with the, uh, with the Founding Fathers, you had mentioned that, they, that even if they weren't explicitly Christian, that they operated a Christian worldview. But, but we're still benefiting from that because they had, yeah. I mean, they 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 had they adapted they adapted the Christian world uh, the Christian view of the fallenness of man yes. and with the division of power, uh, the you know the three branches of government se the separation of power I should say so I mean they I mean they uh, even beyond um, I mean they had a they had a more developed view of Christianity than what Christians have today even if they weren't Christians it seems uh, like. interesting point yes 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 certainly. Uh, John Adams, who again was Unitarian, had what I would call a very well-developed Christian worldview, understood human nature. Uh, John Adams made the statement once that uh, uh, the people can be as tyrannic as any king. John Adams wanted, of course, a virtuous society. He wanted freedom. He wanted freedom. Most people at that time certainly understood the threat to freedom from one individual who had too much power, such as George III of England, and was willing to use that power to suppress those who disagreed with him. That was well understood. There were those starting to express views such as Thomas Jefferson that the people are fundamentally good. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Frenchman of the 18th century, had the view that the general will was right because it was a general will. The general will is uh, the expression of the majority. Uh, and for uh, Rousseau to be asked the question, what do you do if the general will is wrong, was absolutely inconceivable. It would just be like asking any one of us, what do you do if, I, if you find out that God is evil? Uh, or what do you do if you find out uh, that God doesn't exist? A, a question, we won't, con we won't consider that question, uh, because there's no ground for a discussion of it. And so Rousseau was convinced that the majority was right because it's the majority. That's a typical liberal view. The majority determines what is right. Uh, I used to try that with my father as a kid. Why can't I do it? All the other guys are. Uh, he never bought that one. He hadn't studied uh, Rousseau or Hamilton. But it's, he certainly knew enough uh, that that wasn't going to go anywhere with him. Uh, so Rousseau had that view. So did Thomas Jefferson, really had this view about the innate goodness of human beings, Rousseau, Jefferson was convinced that the more we educated people, the better they would be. He wasn't worried about sin in nature, uh, you must be born again, uh, regenerated. No, education is the answer. Education is the answer. You still have liberals today proclaiming that. If you have any problem in society, first of all, what you need is a government program. That's a good liberal response. As a societal problem, you've got to have a government program, and it probably all comes back, we've well, got to spend more on education, you've got to put more money, and that was Jefferson. But you're right, overall, overall, the founding fathers were not Jeffersonian. They either were John <coughs> Jay, Roger Sherman Christians, or they were John Adams, Christian worldview 
non-theological Christians. Very clear. The common law, which was based on the Bible, was the law of the land. And judges could appeal to it when they made their decisions. And uh, that's, that's the progress of history, is to come back to um, having the Bible as your source of right and wrong, of your ideas of right and wrong. Everything else is just uh, lurching sideways from that ultimate goal. And uh, we're going that way, too. It's inevitable. Right, that's Blackstone. Uh, you start off looking to God, and then you come into the law. Uh, Blackstone is legendary name in the legal profession, but he started with God. Then yeah, going once, going yes, ma'am. Just a um, curious uh, <coughs> Christianity developed from the beginning that the Christian has been grossly oppressed, persecuted. And to the point that uh, Christianity gained a great amount of power over over government. And uh, I think that is the fact, the history, that's where the, the, the Bible, the King James Version comes from, is the, uh, come from the, the government act, uh, acknowledged Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, but now, uh, American was founded basically uh, under the Christian belief, Christian mm -hmm. worldview. Now it's getting water, watered down as you speak. And this is a very interesting phenomenon from the beginning, from grossly oppressed to gain power. And then from the power to the, to the water down. And another phenomenon was, uh, was a very <coughs> that Christianity has been uh, uh, very popular now in Asian countries, in African American, in African mm -hmm. countries. And that is a very interesting phenomenon. Another phenomenon was, uh, um, my impression was uh, almost 100% of American, either atheists or Christians, or whatever the, the belief they, they are, they are, or most of them, maybe 99% of them, they went through Christian education. At least they go to Sunday school, or, or their parents, or their families, they were Christians. And uh, then they turn around, uh, uh, between their uh, uh, first law. And uh, what's your comment on this kind of uh, very interesting phenomenon? Well, first of all, I agree with your conclusions that Christianity started off persecuted, <laughs> and came to power, Christians came to power in the Roman Empire, and uh, then Christians started to water down. That's an intriguing phenomenon, and it's it tr uh, fascinating to me today, the number of Christians who are really intimidated by being called judgmental, or discriminatory, or you're imposing your view. That's something I was going to get into more next week, um, so I may not bite on that one further, uh, but uh, that's too bad that Christians do have that particular view. And go back a generation, and yes, people in this country, even uh, who were not, even those who were not what we'll call capital C Christians, uh, believing Christians, still had an understanding of the Bible. Uh, I go back far enough. I started off in public school and ended up in private school. Uh, I can remember though. Uh, Chapter 2 of Luke at Christmas time in the public schools. And I can remember, I think, probably remembering more clearly uh, the birth of Christ verses from Luke from school, Christmas festivals, more than from Sunday school. So it was there. It was there. Uh, and yes, uh, my parents were sort of oh, pro forma Episcopalians. We went to church on key holy days and kids go to Sunday school. But that's a typical family. That was a typical, proper family of that time. We're not really devout, uh, but kids go to Sunday school. That's part of the upbringing. Part of the upbringing. And biblical phrases, biblical figures of speech were well understood. Uh, today, much less so. You can't automatically use a biblical figure of speech and assume that young people understand what you're talking about. 
So yes, the society did have this woven in more. Now we have segments of society which are, I think, maybe deeper, I think they're more deep Christians today than they were when I was growing up. Well, not just more, proportionately more. Of course, the country was a lot smaller when I was growing up. Uh, but proportionally, I think that deeply believing Christians are a larger segment of the population, but the unbelieving